Okay, uh, today we'll talk about two subjects, uh, fractal geometry and uh, the architecture of, of Imre Markovets. Um, so why, why this subject, uh, fractal geometry and architecture? Because of this gentleman, Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, who was born on, uh, on uh, November 20th. So let's read a little bit about him. Uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, born uh, the 20th of November, 1924, and died in October 2010, was a Polish-born French-American mathematician and polymath with broad interest in the practical sciences, especially regarding what he labeled as the art of roughness, a, a nice wording, um, of physical phenomena and the uncontrolled element in life. He referred to himself as a fractalist and is recognized for his contribution to the field of fractal geometry, which included coining the word fractal, as well as developing a theory of roughness and self-similarity in nature. He, these are his words in his introduction to the fractal geometry of nature. Clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, and bark is not smooth, nor does lightning, uh, lightning travel in a straight line. Interesting statement. Uh, Clark notes uh, an odd coincidence that the name Mandelbrot and the word mandala for a religious symbol, which I'm sure is a pure coincidence, but indeed the Mandelbrot set does seem to contain an enormous number of mandalas. This is also a subject to, to reflect um, upon. So I, I'll show actually the, the, some of the examples I show are not, are not necessarily fractals in the, in the sense Mandelbrot gave to this word, there are other, I would call them neurotical fractals, but um, um, especially those made in our time, maybe appropriately. But I think uh, um, um, reflecting on what fractals means, uh, fractals mean, and uh, you know, contemplating the some some contemporary works might be useful. Um, the, the fractals were used without the word and without the consciousness about them, uh, you know, in, in all times as well, both in, uh, in Europe and in other parts of the world, in other cultures. This is, for example, a, a modern uh, contemporary example in Australia. Although I, I imagine Mandelbrot would have uh, distanced himself from this kind of understanding what fractals mean. But all in all, it is an attempt to, to fragment monolithic um, entities uh, into, into small fragments. And I think the, uh, this fragmenting is, is uh, beneficial to culture in general. To quote the title of a book that was recommended to me by Kenneth Frampton, and today is his birthday as well. <clears throat> uh, let's wish him uh, Happy birthday on his ninety uh, first. Um, uh, you know he is 90, uh, 91 years old today, and he recommended me this book. Small is beautiful. Well, if small is beautiful, then fractals uh, are uh, worth uh, worthy of our attention. So this is, I, I just have a collage of various uh, projects and works built and unbuilt uh, and images that refer uh, more or less explicitly to what uh, fragmentation and fractals mean. This is from uh, the works of uh, Peter Eisenman. Now from object to field, Peter Hudak, uh, this uh, I, I like. I kind of like the the wording between ob uh, between between object and field, because in a way fragmentation refers to this: the dissolution of the object into the field, without though losing its own uh, its own its own identity. These are uh, you know contemporary. Uh, uh, drawings and uh, diagrams and images. 
but in older times, fragmentation was understood differently. And we are going to see some examples. In a certain way, almost any building built with, let's say, bricks is containing some methods of obtaining uh, uh, fragmentation or uh, fractals, because the brick, through its repetition, creates various uh, architectural entities or contexts. But every time, uh, this is more like uh, in the spirit of what uh, uh, Mandelbrot um, imagined uh, about uh, fractals. Uh, that's why the reference to mandala. But this is a different kind of fragmentation. It's a fragmentation where you don't have a repetition of the same elements over and over again at various scales. Interesting to reflect also on the difference between the way fragmentation takes place today and the way it took place in the past. Uh, you know, uh, today there is some kind of a neurosis and we have to acknowledge it. I mean, the, the certitudes that the past had, we do not have. And those certitudes were uh, founded on uh, usually on uh, the cosmos of hope that a certain religious system offered. But we, that, that cosmos of hope is eroded and uh, the religious systems are eroded too. For example, uh, the, the faith of the builders of this uh, a mosque um, we do not have these days. And it's possible that even in Islam, it does not exist in, in the same pure um, ideal form. But this is a beautiful example of uh, fractals. And you wonder how was it possible that these people build something like this without any of the technology that we have today. Now Toyo Ito, Serpentine Gallery Pavilion 2002 in London. It is fragmented, but again, the fractals are uh, different from what Mandelbrot thought of. Nevertheless, is a deterioration, is a, is a, is a fragmentation of the cube that uh, uh, aims, aims at, at uh, uh, you know, uh, an expression of, of uh, a resistance against the monolithic uh, meanings and monolithic uh, representations and monolithic uh, constructions. You see, it's, it's all about cutting down, you know, fragmenting. In a way, even deconstruction is about fragmentation. But there is rigor here. These are very precise operations through which, in, in this case, for example, Toyo Ito, um, you know, uh, cut through the body of an otherwise rather placid prism. Now, another building by Toyo Ito, Sumika Pavilion, in the spirit of the previous one, It's also an attempt to break frontiers between floor, wall, and ceiling. So things become uh, ambiguous and uh, more complicated. It's an attempt, in a way, paradoxically, 
not through not towards isolation but quite the opposite towards wholeness but a wholeness achieved through adding up individualities or um, you know yes uh, specific identities Even the bench has a certain level of uh, uh, fragmentation, you know, if you consider these uh, circles or, uh, you know, fragments of circles incorporated into the horizontality of the plane of the bench. And actually here there are, the surface is also a little bit depressed. So it's, 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 it's not a continuously flat uh, surface. the structure itself becomes uh, ambiguous. You don't have any longer the so-called classical, you know, structure with the vertical uh, columns and horizontal beams. It's, it's something else. It becomes a carcass and becomes also ornamental. Now the Gothic vaults, which are magnificent, but they have a centrality which we might long for, but is certainly not an, an adequate expression of our time. Because again, at that time, there was that cosmos of hope that uh, religion provided, but that connection with the, with the faith or with religion, we do not have these days. Fragmentation also took place in the in the in the surface of the glass of the stained glass windows and look at the ceiling. Every single single part contributes to the whole. And the whole doesn't hide the parts that compose it. It expresses them. So there is multiplicity in unity. There is also a center here. There is also a periphery, but there are both. In today's, you know, in the contemporary works, like in the buildings that we saw by Toyo Ito, we don't have an explicit center. It's, it's in, as if periphery took over a possible preceding uh, uh, order or a preceding center. Now Zaha Hadid architects the Morpheus Hotel, uh, which uh, has uh, elements in common actually with the examples from the past and uh, an explicit uh, quest for order, which is in a way surprising when we consider that at the beginning Zaha Hadid was considered a deconstructivist. This is not any longer a deconstructivist work. There is fragmentation, but it's an ordered fragmentation, which seems to aspire towards some kind of new order. There are still distortions, especially outside, but um, all in all, it's a web of relationships that seem to, uh, seems to proclaim uh, some kind of a fluidity which, which uh, leads uh, towards some kind of seen or less seen or uh, anticipated uh, center. And this is shown in some parts of the interior like for example, in the image on the right, you can see the difference between the outside and the inside. 
Inside there is a triangular geometry. There are no curvatures. At the outside there are curvatures. This is kind of interesting. I mean, they are, there are triangulations on the left image as well, but there are, they are curved. Here in the interior, they are not, except uh, the, the top. the process of becoming of this building is impressive. You know, we, when you look at the complexity of the structure, bringing together all these elements is, is, is amazing. And uh, in a way, you know, it can be compared with the complexities in a Gothic cathedral, except that this is a secular building and it was not supposed to pay homage to what we call God. Now, Michael Hansmeier and his um, uh, digital columns, here he is talking uh, about his uh, workings with um, sophisticated uh, digital technology. There is also a lot of fragmentation here and also a quest for some kind of a centrality that was um, you know, difficult to anticipate even uh, a number of years ago. These are, I call them architectural embroideries. These are 3, 3D printed uh, and uh, show clearly the return of the ornament. I would also uh, name this uh, process of visceralization of architecture. It seems that uh, we are not any longer happy with those uh, placid uh, round white columns that are uh, identical at the bottom and at the top. Here we have a different kind of understanding of, uh, of, of architecture and of what a column is. And he created columns that are extremely elaborated and, uh, you know, I call them visceral. And not just columns, of course. But the new technologies uh, allow us to, 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 to actually build in this way and with less effort uh, than in the past. Not that uh, effort is necessarily bad, but uh, human beings do have a tendency to do whatever is necessary in order to avoid effort. Although it's probably not easy to, to avoid pain in one form or another. But as Leonardo da Vinci said, pain and pleasure are twins. Islamic architecture, which is remarkable in this field of fractal geometry, uh, these people were amazing with their knowledge of uh, not just, uh, you know, drawing or imagining these structures, but building them. You know, uh, you wonder how they did it. And they seem to enjoy themselves even in the present. Of course, what they worked on in the present is different from what happened in the past, but this complexity is amazing, amaze me. And it's not just about the structure, the physicality of the structure, but also the, the pictorial beauty of the 
by dimensional representations that ornate all these fragments that come together in splendid ways. Bravo to them. How did they do this? I mean, each fragment here is different, you know, and yes, similar in a way, and they all contribute to the whole. It's an image of the cosmos in a way. Look at this. In his wildest dreams, perhaps Mandelbrot would not have thought of something like this, which was done centuries earlier. Magnificent architecture. And whatever Adolf Loos might have said, Structure and ornament need each other. What I look at now leaves me speechless. They certainly work for the glory of God. And you cannot really honor God with a terrace jardin. Sorry, Monsieur Le Corbusier, you can't. Could we, well, anyway, I should not get into this, but I, I felt a tendency to uh, desire to, to be polemical towards Adolf Loos, an architect I admire otherwise. But his, um, you know, connecting uh, ornamentation or ornament with crime, I think can be debated. And should be debated. In my opinion, only an insensitive person would debate the beauty of these buildings. The human hand, and without the human hand, those beautiful buildings we saw would not have been. Even fragmented, even if uh, eroded, they are still beautiful.
Alhambra. It is a glorious architecture. I don't use many words now because I better contemplate the pictures in silence. We don't know the names of these builders, but they are not needed. They didn't work for signatures or for, uh, you know, uh, underlining their own individuality. It was a collective work in the direction of beauty and in, in, the, in the direction of God. Even Frank Lloyd Wright, who didn't admire uh, much architecture besides his own, admired a lot the blue tiles and the blue domes of Persian architecture. Now we look at some very different works, uh, contemporary works, Melbourne Federation Square Lab Architecture Studio. Uh, you know, from the images that we just saw from Islamic architecture to this, there is some distance. It is as if that ordered uh, belief in an ordered uh, cosmos, well, I shouldn't say order cosmos because in Greek, the word cosmos means order. But something happened, something collapsed. We don't believe any longer in what um, uh, the previous building showed us. We still long for some kind of a complexity and, and um, you know, uh, fragmentation, uh, but it's of a different kind of order, psychologically speaking and formally speaking. These are shards, frag fragments from a hole which was broken. Nevertheless, a courageous work. Well, sorry, this image belongs to Louis Sullivan. I don't know why I introduced them. Maybe, maybe I wanted to, to contrast the, the ornamentation of, uh, of Louis Sullivan with what we just look at here.
the ornamentation, the ornaments of Louis Sullivan also, you know, uh, proclaim the the beauty and the necessity even of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, fragmentation, uh, fractals, but in a very different way from what we saw in Melbourne. Now, fractal, fractal mandalas, since uh, at the beginning I mentioned, I read that, uh, you know, even the name of Mandelbrot somehow makes one think of mandalas and the, the, the the pictorial uh, uh, reality of a mandala does resemble the, the fractals of Mandelbrot. But these are decorative, you know, they, the form indeed connects with, uh, with the frontals, fractals of nature, but uh, there are similarities, but I think more of an external order. But at least these have a center, as opposed to what we saw in Melbourne, which does not. But at the same time, what we saw in Melbourne is probably more accurate in its uh, representing our time than what we look at here. That's why these, uh, you know, digital mandalas seem to me at least uh, remote and rather artificial and somehow not telling the truth about our time, about our time. They are too pleasing. 